Good morning, Tim. Good morning, mate. How are, How are you today? Yeah, all good. Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. Yeah, I know you're not happy because you decided to try and catch a falling knife and buy the kiwi. What stupid idea that was. Listen, it's not as stupid an idea as locking down an entire country over one COVID case. Yeah, well, you know, you, you should have thought about this, okay, because consider where you were trying to trade it, okay? You're trying to trade it in the middle of August, um, early in the session, when there's no liquidity about. So you're going to get shafted about there. There's yeah, no precision that at that time. That is very true. That is very true. And I completely, <laughs> completely accept that. But I still don't accept the logic behind locking down the entire... Well, not, it's not just locking down the entire country. It's the whole strategy of, the, of zero COVID as a, oh, as a policy. I, you know, I just, that's, it just seems ridiculous to me. And we've gone now, right, from, from, from one virus case, the Kiwi is down 1.5% in a day. Um, they, they were talking about potentially hiking rates, you know, the, uh, in terms of market pricing. They were talking about potentially hiking rates by 50 basis points at the next meeting. Um, now that's being downgraded to no rate hikes at all, just because one person has COVID. I think this is what... Um you know, is, is, in, is maybe important to remember with kind of smaller central banks. So, you know, New Zealand is a major economy, but they are relatively small in terms of uh, how they might react to certain policy um, outcomes. I mean, I, I mentioned a few weeks ago that dairy is, you know, massive for the New Zealand economy. So um, something like dairy prices collapsing or demand for dairy falling could be a reason as to why New Zealand uh, central bank doesn't actually want to raise rates. So in this case, when you're looking at somewhere with a population of what, 6 million, um, small events like that can lead them to have pretty drastic outcomes. Um, so yeah, I think that's just something to be to be wary of. Um, I think the real story today is is obviously with, uh, with, with the Aussie as well, because, you know, I'm talking my own book here, but I'm short the Aussie. Um, it's had a nice collapse through 80 and sorry, short Aussie versus the yen. And it's had a nice collapse through 80 um, and also long pound Aussie. So had a bit of a uh, bit of a touch there today. Um, but yeah, I think it is stemming from the, the kind of whole regional um, issues that are going on to do with COVID um, and yeah. growth prospects stemming out of that, I guess. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely, and yeah, and you've got the the China crackdown as well. There's more more regulatory pressures sort of coming through every day at the moment on everything. You know, last night it was um, online competition basically, which is obviously pretty much you know that can cover pretty much anything. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the Evergrande chairman has been uh, I don't know if ousted is the right word, but replaced is probably the a, a good word to use for now, just because we don't know the full full story um but voluntarily chairman, resigned under pressure let's yeah put let's, let's put that and i think i know where the pressures come from but um you know it's it's quite a big story considering he is the billionaire backing it um and so you know their their bonds are off again um they're, they're trading to the downside even further so still that same shit show of a picture coming out of china um and naturally their credit impulse has declined even further um, we've seen that the US 10 year uh, also took a little tumble yesterday. It's trading well below the 200 daily moving average now. Um, and yeah, I, I think the, the direction for yields again is set. If you want to look at it from a technical analysis perspective, it's kind of made a double bottom down at one spot, one, two, seven, eight percent. Um, so yeah, my view is that yields do head lower indeed. Um, and we're, we're still in a bit of a pickle. And interestingly, the piece that uh, the veteran shared today from Bank of America, um, it mentioned that their, you know, the, the, the trade to, to be in, uh, potentially if you're thinking of a growth scare, they, they consider it to be contrarian, is to be long bonds versus stocks. And the long bond trade looks like the right one to, to be in from my perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, and you've, you've been quite vocal about that for a, well, for a few months now, to be fair. 
so yeah, I to- totally agree. Um, and just on the on the moving average front as well, just something that um, that was pointed out and that I've sort of looked into as well is um, is if you look at, I mean, obviously it doesn't apply perfectly on in the bond market. The 50-day moving average on yields um, since June, it's basically sort of every it's capped every every rally in yields. So they haven't gone beyond the 50 day moving average. So that might actually be if, if it's going to reverse, that might be an interesting sort of um, signal to, to confirm the yields are going the other way. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I, 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 I do think that there's another interesting line here in the uh, in the uh, global fan, fund, fund manager, fund manager survey. Um, yeah. which says that uh, expectations for global growth cut to net 27%, lowest since April 20, for profits to 41%, lowest since July 20. First time since July 20, profit margins are expected to fall. This despite investors raising size of US infrastructure spend from $1.4 trillion to $1.7 trillion. Um, that's quite damning, I think. Um, Very. We did mention peak growth. Um, uh, a little while ago and I do think that it is kind of coming to a head Um, and I I, you know consistently over the years China has been kind of the one that props up global growth and I do think that is stemming from China with all of these regulatory crackdowns there's no coincidence that you know people are finally coming out and saying that shit there could be a bit of a growth scare Um, and with all of these you know credit declines in in China the, the deleveraging, the property market facing a tumble, you know, I, I do think that's where it's stemming from. And um, personally, I do think that we were right in saying that the, the, the flight to safety was stemming from these China issues, which is why yields yeah. remain subdued and never hit that 2% level on the 10 year. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's bang on actually. Yeah, I think uh, the market sort of sniffed this out long before it was really in, um, you know, being, being covered in mainstream media. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it was it was uh, that same same issue uh, that I'd mentioned back in February or March, where all of the articles were pointing to, um, you know, inflation being a scare. But we just haven't necessarily seen that translate into the market. We haven't seen it at all. Um, And I, I feel like especially after that last cpi print where we saw those transitory elements kind of remain under a bit of pressure uh we saw what transportation services down 1.1 percent we saw uh shelter have a have a 10 basis point miss um what else did we see we saw cars it was used cars cars, used like cars. 10 percent month over month for three months running to 0.2 percent yeah no absolutely so um, you know, we're kind of seeing that feed through and um, there's been so many knee jerk reactions to data points. I mean, think of the, the, the data point of, uh, of lumber, for example, you know, people were saying that this had something to do with monetary policy and stuff like this. No, it's purely supply chain, chain driven. And when these supply chains rectify themselves, that's why you see lumber collapse, what, negative 30% year, year on year. Or year to date or something i can't remember which yeah. one it was, yeah, but, it's massive um yeah you know so many knee-jerk reactions and this is why i've maintained that looking at the longer term trend of things like yields of things like uh, rate of change of inflation um you know the demographic issue is so vital because if you're just looking at the noise kind of on a month to month sometimes even week to week basis then you're just going to shaft yourself yeah, completely, completely. And I mean, one thing as well that's going to come through more and more that I think he's mentioning here in the in the survey as well is these profit margins. You know, there's there's only so much that for, that that these firms can pass on to consumers rapidly um, in terms of like the increase in their input costs, and that is you know that's going to weigh on things going forwards unless the economy can pick up. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, the other thing I I think there could be a What's the reverse of a tantrum? An inverse tantrum. <laughs> inverse tantrum, let's, let's say that. Um, I, I think there's actually the potential for the S&P 500, for example, to hit 5K. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think the actual tapering timeline might be extended further. And that is the actual surprise that, that will occur. 
What do you reckon about that? It's, yeah, this is an interesting contrarian view for sure. Because, I mean, because the thing is with, with that as well, if, if, there's, if there is a slowdown in growth and everything, then they can easily just, they can easily say, for example, because, I mean, again, this is where a lot of people get confused. Even while they're tapering, they're still net purchasing, yeah. but, you know, bonds and, 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 and um, uh, mortgage-backed securities. So even if they say, say they go through, I don't know, a couple of months of tapering, say they announce it, let's be really bullish and say they announce it next month, I think that'll probably be a bit too soon, but let's pretend. Um, you know, and then they're going to start from, say, November. You know, they get a couple of months of tapering in, at maybe 15 billion a month. Mm-hmm. They can just they can just stop. They can just stop, and they're still offering. What would that be? 50 billion. They'd still be offering 90 billion a month if they just paused, and that QE could continue for three, four, five months longer at 90 billion a month. Yeah. No, I I I, I think that might be the. The way in which they they kind of move it um yeah because they they they're certainly going to have to have a reason um especially when they focus so much on data they're going to have to have a reason to actually taper um and i i just don't think the reasons as tangible as people think yeah you know hopefully sometime they 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 do have a reason to do it because it means that growth's in the right place and and whatnot, but I, I think there's a real conundrum that they they're in at the moment because they're in uh, they're in such a no man's land. I feel um, with with how data is is looking, and also there's points beyond their control, such as China, such as you know supply chains elsewhere, that is just making it kind of an unknowable, a real unknowable. Um, and to some extent, I feel like they, they should forecast a little bit rather than just sticking to the data points because these unknowables just won't necessarily contribute to any kind of policy decision, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is the problem with the new policy is that it wasn't designed for this type of situation. It was designed for the the kind of slow growth where, where pretty much everything was known or, you know, uh, it was pretty much constant. That's probably what I was thinking of it. It was pretty much constant. You know, the, the way that supply chains were working, how efficient everything was, all of that was known pre, pre-pandemic pre um, and they were still struggling to meet, meet their inflation goals. So it made sense then. Um, but obviously now with all of these, all of this weird data that's going in in terms of the supply chain, you know, the commodity prices going up, will they stay up or will it just be volatility that will play out over a, you know, a period of a year? Um, you know, employment as well. How do they measure that? You know, because again, how many people have actually retired? How many of those people that say they've retired are going to stay retired? Um, you know, and, and also what happens as well with the um, uh, with the end of the unemployment benefits? Because, I mean, I was reading something the other day that said that I think it was 40% of under 35s, I think it was, have said that they want to, they, they want a new job. They want to, they want to try and get a different job, you know, change careers. It's kind of given everyone a, a pause for thought to change. And how do you, you know, how do you fit that in to actual data unless you're just going to keep rates low and, you know, for what, two years for it to all, yeah. I mean, suppose they probably are going to keep them right low for two years, but, you know, do they not tighten monetary policy by, you know, by gradually tapering QE or any of that while they wait for all of that to play out? It's just not realistic to think that's going to happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's a difficult time to be a central banker, I think. It's really, yeah. really tricky. Um, have you had any more thoughts on anything that I might not have seen in the market? Um, I don't know what no, I've seen. Or just, 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 just one, just one thing to kind of to keep an eye on. You know, there's um, I, I shared it this morning. Something from SGH Macro Advisors saying that apparently, you know, and obviously it's just a rumor, but you never know that, that President Xi has sent a message to Biden via diplomatic channels to suggest a de-escalation in tensions would be the best of interest of both nations, uh, which I find I find very interesting if that turns out to be true. Um, you know, it's an olive branch that's being extended. And there was a bit of talk about, um, I think it's a G20 meeting in October. There's certainly a G something meeting in October. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure it's G20, that they might be looking to, ha- to actually meet up there, even, you know, it was even from a few months back, to try and reset US-China relations. Um, and I think that will actually go a long, long way for, you know, for helping with uh, growth, uh, expectations for sure whether it actually transpires that there is renewed growth and everything else is uh, again another question to be confirmed but 
I think that that would definitely pick up sentiment if uh, if US-China relations can be, uh, I, won't, I won't say mended, um, but sort of, you know, partially repaired, shall we say, to avoid some of the worst outcomes. I guess it's all about perception, isn't it? Um, yeah. Because the, the thing with US-China relations is that they're so, such different nations in terms of kind of uh, uh, culturally, um, politically, but I don't think there could ever be any real cohesive, what's the word? Kind of like a cohesive relationship, especially after how things have uh, played out over the last couple of years. Um, and probably even longer than that, actually. Um, yeah. So I think it's more just <laughs> kind of like a paranoid relationship where they try and work in lockstep as much as possible. But I do think that there are uh, structural issues in China, which would have some uh, grand effects there, especially with how, you know, they now want to change um, the, the demographic composition, I guess, is, is probably the best way to explain it. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, cracking down on these US listings, um, the education thing to get more, I think the, the policy was to get more births or something. You explained it before, I can't remember. Yeah, that, that's, um, they, want, they want to increase the birth rate for sure. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they'll achieve it. Um, the middle class in China is completely decimated, pretty much. Um, I've heard anecdotal evidence there. So they are becoming very, very similar, but with very different aims as well. Um, so I don't know if the relationship can ever actually work unless China moves away from kind of the, the central control and, and conquer type uh, politics. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think that's the right, the right way of thinking about this. I kind of... I mean, we talked about decoupling uh, back before COVID, didn't we, in 2019, I think it was, originally. Um, and I think that that is, in the end, going to be a, a, long part, a large part of the goal, because obviously China can't keep being the world's manufacturing base, because they're just not going to have the staff to, you know, to man the factories and everything else. So that's a natural kind of thing that's just going to happen. Um, you know, the US doesn't want it, because obviously they need more jobs at home. Um, and China doesn't want it to continue because they're not going to have the demographics to be able to support that. And they're going to look elsewhere for it um, and, you know, try and find factories of their own overseas now um, yeah. for all of that low level manufacturing. So you've kind of I think there is a natural kind of regional decoupling that's going to happen anyway. But at the same time, the, the, the two biggest economies in the world have to work together to manage that whilst also competing elsewhere to try and secure the best you know the best sort of options for for their own country in terms of getting you know getting goods manufactured cheaply innovation and everything else and i do think that'll end up being regional i really do i think the us is going to is going to be more moving more towards south america um whereas obviously china is going to be moving more into asia you know potentially through what we've looked at with afghanistan as a as a part of that i'm not going to say a central part of it but in that whole region around there where there's a lot of conflict i do think yeah. china's going to going to try and extend into there extend influence into there because it is a regional a regional hub that they've got on their doorstep. Yeah. Um, something that I've just uh, thought of literally while we've been talking um, and before it leaves my head is um, Aussie Kiwi. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at Aussie Kiwi on a four hour chart, there is a level at, uh, where are we? One spot zero five two five roughly. And we've just traded into it and it's pushed off. Now uh, the, the, the 200 uh, EMA on the four hour chart is currently a uh, one spot zero five six four. I think there's good risk to reward here, especially considering what you said earlier today um, about, you know, it being an overreaction. Um, it, it does certainly look like that from my perspective here. I think you might have just been a tiny bit too early on it. Um, I on. And maybe, yeah. Yeah. And maybe looking at the wrong pair. So, the, the, the downtrend, if you consider how we were thinking of the pound Aussie trade, the, the downtrend is still sort of firmly in, in the Kiwi's favour and, and not favouring uh, the, the Aussie dollar purely based off of the COVID situation. OK, you're looking at one versus, you know, a ton of uh, a ton more COVID cases in in Australia and the poor vaccine response, et cetera, et cetera. So. From a technical perspective and a bit of a, 
uh, a fundamental perspective here. I think Aussie Kiwi could be a nice one to the downside if you haven't actioned any Aussie trades already. You don't want to be triple exposed. So that would just be stupid. Um, no, of course, of course. So, yeah, I'd, so agree with C- you I'd agree with you there. I think that's a nice C- one. Traders, C traders just said Labour data is a big weight for upcoming Fed meetings through end of year. Absolutely. Um, yep. And used cars is like a third of CPI. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, and, you know, with that used cars number, that's that's why we mentioned it, because it had been pushing inflation to the upside for two, three months there. Um, and it seemed to have softened at the last CPI print. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens to that number. Um you know, at the next one, because my thoughts would be that that's kind of a, uh, you know, seeing it soften to, to that extent so quickly is, uh, is is quite a key data point to, to look at when it's been so important previously. Um, you know, the, the core components of CPI um, are, are much more important than just looking at the, the actual figure. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, anything else to add, Tim? No, I think that's pretty much covered quite a bit there. Um, certainly everything that caught my eye immediately we've covered for sure. So uh, no, just what, I really want to see what happened to the Kiwi now because obviously uh, I think the meeting's um, in the early hours of tomorrow morning UK time, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm not convinced that they're just going to not hike rates over this one virus case at all. I'm really not. Even though it's priced out? It, well, yeah, even though it's priced out. I mean, I just don't... It just seems to me to be complete... I mean, it's someone... Who was it Rishi Rishi Mishra who I follow on on rates uh, yeah. quite a lot? He's basically said, well, you know, what what are the what what are the Reserve Bank of New Zealand going to do? Are they going to delay hikes every time that there's a little lockdown or there's one one virus case? Um, they might as well just link monetary policy to the eighty percent vaccination rate. You know, yeah, I don't make, well, I mean, you know, it, I mean, I think um, the the market might be looking at it from okay, how long will this this national lockdown be? Because it is national; it's not even just you know, a city lockdown. Um, what impact will that have on growth? How will the market take a hike in that in that way? Um, so I, I think it's just more uncertainty that's been put into into the market that's yeah. led to led to this. Um, but I, I would tend to agree with you. I, I don't really see it as being you know anything to change monetary policy based on, especially when the mechanism for monetary policy takes hold in you know six to 12 months, maybe a little bit shorter for an economy like New Zealand. But um, but yeah, uh, I, I don't really see it as being um, that drastic an event to, to change any policy. Um, okay, we'll leave it there for today. Cheers, guys, for listening and speak to you later. Cheers, guys.